were born into this world without an instruction booklet. There's nothing that explains what are the important issues in life, what are the important things to know. We do know when we feel suffering, and we know when we feel relative ease. But that's about as much as we know. And as we grow up, there are people to explain things to us. This is where human beings have an advantage over animals. There's nobody to explain. There's nobody to explain anything, say, to a dog or a cat about how to live. There's that wonderful story by Mark Twain where the mother dog explains to her puppy the human world. But of course, that's fantasy. And what's interesting about that story is the mother has her information all mixed up. And that's one of the dangers of the human world. We're taught things from childhood, and our parents may have all things all mixed up as well. So there are a lot of things that we don't know, and we have to make a lot of decisions based on information that's uncertain. What are the important issues in life? What is this life, anyhow? Is it part of a longer story, or is it just the story, the whole story right here, right now? Birth, aging, death. Well, then how about our actions? We seem to decide what to do. We seem to make choices, and those choices seem to have results. And there seems to be a pattern, to some extent. Some actions lead to some results, other actions lead, <coughs> other actions lead to other results. But are things as they seem? We don't really know. So we find ourselves acting on assumptions. as to what leads to happiness and what leads to pain. Those two things that we do know when we experience them. But the question is, is the quest for happiness really something worthwhile? Or should we be looking for something else? For all of these issues, there's really no hard proof. Which means that when you come to meditate here, you're already acting on certain assumptions. One is that the training of the mind is really worthwhile. That means you believe that your actions are important, and that knowledge and training will make a difference in how you act. Those are big assumptions right there. But if we look at our lives, we see that acting on those assumptions has brought us at least some happiness. That's called a pragmatic proof. It's not an empirical proof. An empirical proof would actually be able to trace what is the energy that goes from our decision to act to the action and from the action to the results that we experience. You could run experiments with controls, and actually be able to measure happiness in a very precise way. But you can't do that. All those tests that they say they've run about measuring the happiness in different countries or measuring the happiness of people with different salaries, different levels of income. 
I'm going to ask the people to rate their happiness on a scale from 1 to 10. Now, what kind of science is that? What's your 8 compared to somebody else's 8 on a scale of 1 to 10? So there's really no empirical proof for any of these things. But there is a pragmatic proof. You, you find that when you act on certain assumptions, things seem to turn out in a particular way, and some assumptions lead to better results than others. That's the kind of proof that the Buddha has you act on. He teaches about the principle of action, that your intention is what determines the result of the action. I know that one action is actually real. There were people in the Buddha's time who said that action was unreal. It didn't really exist. It only seemed to exist. But the Buddha said, well, look how those people live. Do they live as if action didn't exist? Well, they, they're acting, and they choose different courses of action, prefer some to others. It shows that on a pragmatic level they still believe that action is important, and some are preferable to others, some are more skillful than others, and that they really do have an impact on your happiness. There were people who said that your actions didn't really lead to happiness or pain. Happiness or pain were self-caused and very arbitrary. And yet they had a theory all worked out as to why this was so and how to live in response to that belief. In other words, they still believed that your actions were important. One way of action was preferable to another. So this is how the Buddha recommended that you look at the issue of action. What way of believing, or what series of beliefs about action lead you to act? a skillful way, and give good results, a sense of greater or lesser happiness that you can know only for yourself. You can't compare your happiness with somebody else's, but you can look inside. So the Buddha never tried to offer an empirical proof for the teaching on karma or the teaching on rebirth. The people who say that science has proven either of these or they have proven them to themselves in an empirical way, are not doing the Buddha's teachings any favor. Because you can't really prove these things. The Buddha himself didn't try to give an empirical proof. He did say, though, that if you act in certain ways, you will find a greater sense of ease, a greater sense of well-being in life. And these actions will depend on certain assumptions. For instance, the question of rebirth. If you believe that this life is all we've got, and because we know that the end of life is uncertain, would you be sitting here meditating? Maybe, maybe not. It's all pretty arbitrary. Would you be kind to other people? Maybe, maybe not. But if you did go on that assumption that this is part of a longer story, you'd be sure to put more effort into training the mind, to realize that it's important that you're meticulous and careful. You take whatever time is needed to get the mind in good shape. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha recommends that you take this as a working hypothesis. He said that he found in the course of his awakening that it is true that this is part of a longer story that's been going on for a very long time and could potentially continue going on for a very long time. And that one of the reasons for training the mind is ultimately to be able to put an end to that story. Because there's a greater happiness that lies when you don't get reborn. But he also stated that even if this were not the case, you would live a happier, better life. 
by assuming that it is. So when you wonder about these teachings of the Buddha, remember, we're all acting on assumptions. The problem for many of us is that our assumptions are not articulated, and we haven't worked out the consequences of the assumptions that have been articulated. In which case, when we encounter an articulated assumption, it may seem strange. We have to reflect back on ourselves. What are our assumptions about action, about life, about happiness, about the principle of causality, how that works in our lives? And then which assumptions really lead to the greatest happiness if we act on them? if we keep our actions consistent with what we believe. That's what faith is in the Buddhist teachings. Now, for many of us in the West, faith has gotten a bad name. It's, in some circles, it's pushed on us as a virtue, and that the less a particular proposition or idea makes sense, the more faith you have in it, the better which is a real insult to the human mind. And so we felt insulted by these insistent, the insistence that we take certain things on faith and we believe them even more strongly than we believe the evidence right before our eyes or in our own hearts. Fortunately, that's not how the Buddha teaches faith, because for him even taking things on reason is a type of faith. It doesn't guarantee that things are going to be true. But when something's reasonable, it's a lot easier to act on it and not feel torn up inside. And he also asks that when you take something on faith that you realize you don't really know. But this seems the most reasonable, it seems the best. And so far, in your, pra in your experience, it's given the best results when you act on it. But the more clearly you realize that you don't know that, for him, it becomes a spur to continue practicing until you really do know. It gives the example of an elephant hunter in the forest. The elephant hunter wants a big bull elephant to do the work he needs done. As he goes into the forest and he sees big footprints. Now, because he's an experienced elephant hunter, he doesn't immediately jump to the conclusion that this must, these must be the footprints of a bull elephant, because after all, there are dwarf females with big feet. They can't do the work that he wants done. But he sees the footprints, so he follows them. Notice that he does follow them. He doesn't say, well, I don't really know, and then just give up. He wants the elephant. These seem to be the most likely footprints, so he follows them. Then he sees scratch marks high up in the trees. Again, he doesn't jump to the conclusion that those must be the marks of a big bull elephant because there are tall females. But tusks, they could have made those marks. But he keeps looking. And finally he comes to a clearing where there is the big bull elephant. That's when he knows that he's got the elephant that he wants, in the same way with the practice. The pleasure of jhana, psychic powers, those are just footprints and scratch marks. The real thing is when you've had an experience of the deathless, you realize that these assumptions that you acted on, the power of your actions, the pattern of causality, in other words, that a certain principle holds good from the time of the Buddha to now. You act in certain ways, and there tend to be those, the results tend to follow a pattern. And assuming that it's worth your while in this short and uncertain life to devote as much time as you can to the training of the mind, you find that those assumptions worked. They led you to a true happiness. You know for sure. Because you know that this happiness doesn't depend on the aggregates, doesn't depend on space or time. It's not going to be touched by the death of the body. 
that's when you know that you found the bull elephant. Then that's when you really know that the Buddhist teachings were true. So the realization that you're taking certain things on faith, but you don't really know them, that's meant to be a spur to continued practice. The dots that you might have are not considered a vice or something to be denied, because that just creates lots of dishonesty in the mind. Instead, they're to be acknowledged. And taken as an incentive that you want to practice further. You get to the day someday when you really know. It's in this way that the Buddha's teachings on karma and rebirth are not an insult to your intelligence. Instead, they're a spur to use your intelligence even further. So you can get yourself out of the ignorance into which we're born and into the knowledge of a happiness that doesn't die.